briefing I never wanted to give. Um, I'd like to start by saying the prayers of the entire world are with the people of Ukraine today as they suffer an unjustified, unprovoked, and premeditated attack by the Russian military forces. President Biden has said from the start of this crisis, if Putin chooses to invade, the cost to Russia will be immediate and profound to its financial system, to its economy, to its technology base, and to its strategic position in the world. As the world has now witnessed, Putin has made his choice. He rejected diplomacy and chose war. And today, the president has announced our response. Because of Putin's choices, his flagrant violation of international law, and his utter disregard for the principles that underpin peace and security across the world, we will now ensure his decision is remembered as a strategic failure. Today, we impose an unprecedented package of financial sanctions and export restrictions in lockstep with our allies and partners that will isolate Russia from the global financial system, shut down its access to cutting-edge technology, and undercut Putin's strategic ambitions to diversify and modernize his economy. Let me walk you through a few specifics, and I'll be happy to take questions. Uh, on financial sanctions, I stood at this podium on Tuesday and said, uh, we would impose the most severe sanctions ever levied on Russia if Putin proceeded with the invasion. Today, we're following through. We will impose sanctions on Russia's two largest financial institutions, Spare Bank and VTB, which together hold more than half of the Russian banking system's assets, over $750 billion in total. For VTB, we will freeze all of its assets touching the U.S. financial system and prohibit U.S. persons from doing any business with the bank. For Spare Bank, we will sever its access to the U.S. financial system. We'll also freeze the assets of and prohibit any business dealings with three additional Russian banks with combined assets of over $70 billion. We'll also restrict U.S. investors from providing debt or equity financing for 13 of the most critical uh, Russian state-owned enterprises, which combined have estimated assets nearing $1.5 trillion. And finally, we'll also impose sanctions on the executives at these state-owned institutions, as well as additional Russian elites who are complicit in Putin's kleptocracy and their family members, those who've shared in the Kremlin's corrupt gains and stored their wealth in yachts and luxury condos and fancy cars, will now share in the pain of these measures. In terms of the financial impact, as I said, these are the most impactful and significant sanctions uh, the U.S. has ever taken. But financial sanctions are just one part of our response. We're also unveiling today an expansive and unprecedented set of export restrictions developed in historically close coordination uh, with the European Union, Australia, Japan, Canada, New Zealand, the United Kingdom, and Taiwan. These new measures include sweeping restrictions on Russian military end users to impair Putin's military capabilities, and will also deny exports across Russia to sensitive cutting edge technology, primarily targeting Russia's defense, aerospace, and maritime sectors. In total, the United States and our partners will effectively be cutting off more than half of all high tech imports going into Russia. This includes curbing Russia's access to advanced semiconductors and other foundational technologies that Russia needs to diversify and modernize its economy. Working in tandem, these financial sanctions and the export controls will undercut Putin's aspirations to project power on the world stage. Uh, and those impacts intensified dramatically just today. The Russian stock market plunged over 30 percent at one point uh, before being halted by local regulators. Russia's currency, the ruble, weakened to its weakest value on record against the dollar uh, before the central bank intervened. And the price the market is charging the Russian government to borrow is now above 15 percent. These impacts over time will translate into higher inflation, higher interest rates, lower purchasing power, lower investment, lower productive capacity, lower growth, and lower living standards in Russia. To be clear, this is not the outcome we wanted. It's both a tragedy for the people of Ukraine and a very raw deal for the Russian people. But Putin's war of choice has required that we do what we said and to ensure this will be a strategic failure. Finally, let me just say a few words about the impact of Russia's choices on the U.S. Uh, 
We've intentionally scoped our sanctions to deliver severe impact on the Russian economy while minimizing the cost to the U.S. as well as our allies and partners. To be clear, our sanctions are not designed to cause any disruption to the current flow of energy from Russia to the world. We've carved out energy payments on a time-bound basis to allow for an orderly transition of these flows away from sanctioned institutions, and we've provided other licenses to, to provide for an orderly wind-down of business. Let me just stop there and take your questions. Real quick, uh, I, guess the, uh, I just had a real quick question. You said it would take some time before it affects the uh, economy and inflation. What's the timetable? How long do you think it will take until you have demonstrable results? Well, look, um, these, are, these are costs that build over time. And as I mentioned, I think last Friday, uh, any leader, whether you're an autocrat or a small d Democrat, has to pay attention to the living standards uh, of your country. And uh, already, we're seeing the effects of these measures and the signaling that we provided over the last three months. Before these sanctions were implemented, inflation in Russia was 8.7 percent. The government's borrowing costs had spiked above 10 percent. The ruble had lost almost 15 percent of its value. And today, those, those costs escalated dramatically. Now, it's going to be up to President Putin to decide, ultimately, how much cost he's willing to bear. But what we control is to make sure this will be a strategic failure, not just because of the sanctions, but also because of the export controls, because of Europe's accelerated diversification away from Russia in terms of its energy supply, uh, due to our fortification of NATO's eastern flank, and due to the renewed energy and unity and determination by the West to stand up for our values and advance our principles. But to confirm, you're in it for the long haul, right? It's, I mean, you're until you see the results that you want. We understand that these costs will accumulate over time. You've just laid out all of the actions that the U.S. that our allies have taken at this point. As you understand, the questions, though, at this point are about the actions you have not yet chosen to take at this point, specifically the SWIFT system and sanctioning President Putin specifically himself. What are the uh, triggers at this point? Are there actions that President Putin might still take you're expecting that would trigger those sanctions? Or what are the potential complications, especially about sanctioning Putin personally? So I, mean, I understand a lot of questions about SWIFT and about sanctioning President Putin and lots of other measures uh, that could be mentioned. But let me, let me say this. Uh, I think today was a demonstration that we mean what we say. Uh, we delivered on what we said we would do in terms of imposing costs. So when we say all options are on the table and that we're prepared to continue to ratchet costs higher, uh, it would be a mistake to doubt that resolve. But let me, let me also step back and say that when we consider which sanctions to apply, we're not cowboys and cowgirls pressing a button to impose costs. We follow a set of principles. We want the sanctions to be uh, uh, impactful enough to demonstrate our resolve and to show that we have the capacity to, to deliver overwhelming costs to Russia. That's one. Number two, we want them to be responsible, to avoid even the perception of targeting the average Russian civilian, and of course, unwanted spillovers back to the U.S. or the global economy. Number three, we want to stay coordinated. Uh, and so we calibrate our sanctions to maximize the chance that we move in lockstep with our allies and partners. Number four, they should be flexible so that we can escalate or de-escalate depending on uh, facts on the ground. And lastly, as I mentioned before, they have to be sustainable. These sanctions work over the long term. That's what will guide our design. Okay. Uh, in light of the sanctions that were announced against individuals and entities in Belarus, can you tell us whether there are sanctions against any other countries that are being uh, seriously considered at the moment? And what is the line that a nation would need to cross in this conflict for them to uh, receive, be on the receiving end of sanctions from the U.S.? Well, the Belarus measures were about delivering costs to a country that aided and abetted what we saw uh, yesterday and overnight. But I have no, nothing else for you in terms of other countries uh, being targeted. JJ. Oh, did you have a question? Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> uh, I know, I didn't mean, I, I was no, using the arms here. Do you want to come? Yeah, yeah, thank, no, no. thank you, Philly. We'll come back to you. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you about the some of the carve-outs. Uh, there are general licenses for more than a dozen areas, agriculture, energy, and you just said uh, that the importance is to limit the impact on Americans. But I was hoping that you could say, is there a percentage that you can share of the number of exemptions that make up the overall transactions? So the general licenses, how many, how many, what percentage of the transactions are under those licenses? 
I, I would refer you to Treasury and OFAC for the, for the details on what, what exactly uh, is being exempted and the percentage of business that uh, would be included. I mean, could you say, is it a third, is it a half? I mean, is it a small percentage, is it a high percentage? I, I would go back to the, the principles of our design. Um, the measures themselves and the exemptions are balanced so that we can deliver overwhelming costs um, while not having unintended consequences. And so that's the, that's the principle. But as to the specifics, I'd refer you to Treasury. Wouldn't the, wouldn't the oil be a large percentage? I mean, considering how important it is to, uh, to Russia's bottom line? Well, look, um, where we have an asymmetric advantage is in foreign capital and cutting edge technology. Um, so that's where, we're, that's where we're delivering the most concentrated impact. When it comes to energy, um, this is the one area, this is the one area where Russia has systemic importance in the global economy. We know it's the second largest natural gas producer in the world. It's also the second largest crude oil producer in the world. Um, that's not to say that we have a dependence on Russia. Russia depends on those revenues just as much as the world needs its energy. Uh, but we're not going to we're not going to do anything which causes an unintended disruption to the flow of energy as the global economic recovery is still underway. Uh, I'd like to, thanks. Uh, two quick questions, I believe. One, if Putin takes Kyiv, does that trigger additional sanctions, specifically that scenario? Uh, not going to speculate on particular hypotheticals. And you, you mentioned the timeline. You've been asked about the timeline. The president said in one of the answers to his questions today, he said, let's have a conversation in a month to see if these sanctions are working. But my question is, what happens in the meantime? Russia is taking over parts of Ukraine, major parts of Ukraine, as we speak. So the world just sits back and watches that happen until these sanctions take effect. Look, we can't dictate Putin's actions. What we can do is what's within our control and to make sure this is going to be a strategic failure uh, for Russia. And so over the course of the next month, what you can expect is that we'll see an intensifying negative feedback loop in Russian markets. And I've described the elements of that. You'll see record capital, outfly, uh, capital, record, record capital outflows. You'll see a weaker currency. You'll see higher inflation. You'll see lower purchasing power. You'll see lower investment. And that negative feedback loop, the velocity of it, is going to be determined by Putin's own actions. And so that's what you should expect on the financial sanctions front. On export controls, what you can see is that over time, this is going to atrophy Russia's capacity to diversify outside of just oil and gas and to modernize uh, the strategic sectors that Putin himself has said uh, he wants to develop, aerospace, defense, IT, lasers, sensors. These sectors all depend on foundational technologies designed and produced by the West. You will begin to see a chilling effect uh, uh, take hold in Russia as those inputs are denied. Thank you. Um, for weeks now, administration officials have repeatedly said, yourself included, that these sanctions are meant to deter and prevent Putin from moving forward, from acting. Can you help us understand why the president said today that no one expected the sanctions to prevent anything from happening? And then secondly, on a quick one on Putin sanctions, um, without talking about when you might trigger them, can you help us understand what harm they would do to him personally if you were to sanction Putin? Look, on your first question, we don't usually engage in um, hypotheticals up here at this podium, but let's play this out. Had we, had we unleashed our entire package of financial sanctions preemptively, I think a couple things might have happened. Number one, uh, President Putin might have said, uh, look, uh, these people are not serious about diplomacy. They're not engaging in a good faith effort to promote peace. Instead, they're escalating. And that could provide a justification for him to escalate and invade. Secondly, he could look at it as a sunk cost. In other words, President Putin could think, I've already paid the price. Why don't I actually take what I paid for, which is Ukraine's freedom? Um, so that's, that's what we wanted to avoid. Look, ultimately, ultimately, um, the goal of our sanctions is to make this a strategic failure for Russia. And let's define a little bit of what that means. Strategic success in the 21st century is not about a physical land grab of territory. Uh, that's what Putin has done. In this century, uh, power, strategic power, is increasingly measured and exercised by economic strength, by technological sophistication, and your story, who you are, what your values are. Can you attract ideas and talent and goodwill? And on each of those measures, this will be a failure for Russia. Right. Same. I, no, keep, I, I keep texting you. I'm sorry, I didn't. I don't think she's not done yet. Let, let me finish. Go ahead. On President Putin. But 
Did you, but is it fair to say no one expected the sanctions to prevent anything? You certainly expected that, right? Look, we, we signaled as clearly as we could what was coming if Russia proceeded with an invasion. Um, you know, as I mentioned before, economic costs of this severity generally matter uh, to any leader uh, because of the effect it has on, on his people's living standards. In this case, Putin made the wrong choice. I can't comment on what the UK's position is. I'm not, uh, I'm not going to speak to that. But what I'll say is the sanctions measures we impose today, I think without question, were the most consequential ever levied on Russia and arguably the most consequential ever levied in history if you look at the aggregate financial impact on Russia. Um, so that's why we took the measures that we did. And we did so because we could move in lockstep with our allies and partners and because we think the spillover effects will be manageable. I'm trying to figure out if this is still a realistic live round. Is the U.S. really still making an intense effort for this or is it essentially? This being swift? So look, again, I'm just going to repeat, all options are on the table and we're, we're prepared to ratchet costs higher at a time and place of our choosing. And, you know, President Putin should take that seriously after what he saw today. Just two questions. Uh, first, if you were to sanction uh, Vladimir Putin, do you know where his money is? Not going to comment on that. <laughs> and secondly, um, if uh, uh, what is the message to Russia at this point on what it would take to roll back and relieve some of the sanctions that you put in place today? Look, um, the, the road to diplomacy is always open. Um, diplomacy is never dead. But in the current circumstance, in the immediate aftermath of an invasion, um, that, that option is not available. Right now, we're imposing severe consequences on Russia for its decisions. Uh, if there were to be a shift in, in Russia's strategic choices that upheld core principles of respecting your neighbor's borders, respecting your neighbor's sovereignty, allowing countries to have the freedom to set their own course and their own destiny, that would be a different situation, but that's not where we are. Um, you uh, suggested that there are things that still remain on the table, but as you walk through the hypothetical scenarios of trying to keep diplomacy open, um, you, you said that they have now crossed the line. But if you're saying there's still more on the table, do you expect things to get worse in the coming days, that Russia will continue to move forward? Is that the intelligence? I know you guys have been quite transparent about the intelligence you have. Are you keeping things back because you think the situation is going to get worse? Well, I think we've, we've been transparent in, uh, to a remarkable degree. And one aspect of that transparency is by saying um, we can't get into President Putin's head. And so your question requires me to speculate on, on how he's thinking about next steps, and I, I simply can't do that. But just in terms of U.S. intelligence and the way that you are planning out the different sanctions you have and, and keeping things on the table, is that a, a sense that it, it, it will get worse because you want to hold things back? Look, our job is to be prepared and manage risks, all manner of risks. Uh, and that's what we've been doing over the past three months as this crisis intensified. We'll continue doing that. Last one from Steve. Just to follow up from Franco, um, the targeting the Russian energy industry is totally off the table. Is that what you're saying, Billy? What I'm saying is that our measures were not designed to disrupt in any way the current flow of energy from Russia to the world. Now, um, we have also said we are going to cut off Russia's access to cutting-edge technology. That technology can be used across many sectors. Uh, and, and so as it relates to Russia's long-term productive capacity, um, we are seeking to degrade that capacity, but nothing, nothing in the short term as it relates to energy. Thank you so much, Thank you for joining us. Appreciate Thank it. You. Okay, uh, I know it's late, uh, but we will get to as many people as possible. I just wanted to note a couple of things um, at the top for all of you. Uh, one, uh, USAID put out an announcement that they've deployed a DART or disaster assistance response team to respond to humanitarian needs in Ukraine. Uh, this DART team, which is currently based in Poland, is working closely with European allies and partners who will be on the front lines of the response. The team will lead the U.S. government's humanitarian response to help address critical needs caused by Russia's 
invasion of Ukraine. Uh, the DARC comprises 17 disaster experts from USAID who are assessing the situation, identifying priority needs to scale up assistance inside Ukraine, and working with partners to provide rapidly needed assistance to communities affected by the conflict. I know a number of you have also asked me, and we've tried to provide as much detail as possible about uh, how the President has spent his time over the last uh, period since last evening. I think we put out a few details, but just to reiterate for all of you. Um, he closely monitored uh, the events on the ground uh, from both the Oval Office and then back in the residence uh, over the course of last evening. We put out a few details last night, including the fact that he spoke repeatedly with his national security advisor, Jake Sullivan. He also spoke with his U.S.-UN ambassador, Linda Thomas-Greenfield, before she gave that powerful speech uh, at the U.N. last night. He received a briefing from uh, Secretary Austin, Chairman Milley, uh, Secretary Blinken, and his national security advisor uh, around 11 p.m. approximately uh, last evening as well. And as you know, he also spoke with President Zelensky. He continued to monitor closely uh, into the wee hours uh, last night. Uh, this morning, uh, as you all know, he engaged or he met uh, for uh, just about an hour with his national security team, which included um, both a full table in the room and full members from, from the cabinet, from the national security team on the screen. Uh, during that meeting, uh, as is standard, he received an update from, of course, defense, intel, his diplomatic team about the status on the ground, and he has, of course, remained closely engaged with them through the course of the day. As you know, he also had a G7 meeting that lasted a couple of hours this morning, and he also spent an hour this afternoon on the phone with the uh, leaders, leaders in Congress, Democratic and Republican leaders in Congress briefing them on the situation on a secure call, uh, briefing them on the situation on the ground, uh, answering questions they had as well. Uh, so that has been uh, his day to date, uh, and he is continuing, of course, to focus on other priorities as president. Uh, but why don't we go to you, Zeke? Thanks, uh, Jen. Just picking you up on that, uh, has the president made any additional foreign leader calls today? Has he spoken to President Zelensky uh, since their, their, their call last the evening? There's not been another call to President Zelensky. I expect, as, as you have seen over the past several days, he will continue to have calls with leaders. We will keep you abreast as those happen. And with the U.S. government saying that it, it believes that the Russian objective right now is to go decapitate uh, the Ukrainian government, does the U.S. believe that President Zelensky at this moment is safe? Uh, we're not going to get into security uh, security questions, but we are in touch with President Zelensky, and we are uh, working to provide him a range of support. And uh, President Zelensky, in addition to calling for uh, the West to impose to cut Russia off from SWIFT, had also proposed uh, or called for, demanded, I think, a little word he used in a tweet, uh, that, the, uh, that the U.S. Uh, and, and its allies impose a new fly zone over Ukraine. Uh, I know the president has said that he won't put U.S. boots on the ground in Ukraine to fight Russia. Is, is, is Ukrainian airspace uh, is Ukrainian airspace uh, in, in play? Is that something that is subject to any discussions? We've certainly seen. I've seen. We've certainly seen his uh, his tweet uh, or his request to be a tweet. Uh, but I don't have an update on that request. That's not uh, off the table. Uh, no flies not off the table. Uh, again, I, I don't have any update on this point in time or status of the discussions. Go ahead. Thanks. Just a follow up on troops fast and a few cyber questions. Sure. Uh, do you expect NATO to call up a major response force, and how many U.S. troops could be called to help in that effort? That's really up to NATO. As you know, we have a number of troops, thousands of troops that are uh, on call, uh, but that is a decision to be made by the NATO alliance. The president said, if Putin pursues cyber attacks against our companies, our critical infrastructure, we are prepared to respond. So just clarifying, does that first mean that there has not been any evidence of any cyber attack from Russia against any American companies at this point? Not that we have identified or attributed at this point in time. And can you explain? I mean, aside from past ones that you're fairly tracking. Yeah, hey, I guess I mean in the last yes, 24 hours. Yes, I understand. And can you explain more of the White House's thinking on kind of this debate in Washington about whether a cyber attack against a NATO ally would trigger an Article 5 response, a response from the alliance? Well, uh, that, again, is up to the NATO alliance to determine, but obviously a cyber attack does constitute an attack, uh, so that would certainly be a point of discussion among the NATO members. One more really fast. On the US, USAID disaster yeah. response you just mentioned, a 17-person team, 
is that enough? I mean, we're talking about, we've heard you guys talk about the potential of hundreds of thousands you're, of you're refugees. You're absolutely right, and I think that's an important point. But what I, what we're trying to do here is provide any incremental update on the status of what our work is. And I'll just note, and you may be fully aware of this, but in terms of humanitarian assistance, um, we have been the biggest provider of humanitarian assistance to Ukraine. We've provided over $52 million in humanitarian assistance to Ukraine in the past year. Over the past few weeks, we've committed additional funding and supplies to humanitarian organizations. There's been a specific need and therefore a focus on support services, food, clean water, hygiene, shelter, trauma, primary health care, uh, are prepare, are, and we are prepared to pr certainly provide a significant amount more. So this is just one step, obviously less than 24 hours after the events of last night, and we will continue to plus up from here. Go ahead. Uh, Jen, there are a number of protests within Russia itself. Are you monitoring this? What's your message to them? Well, uh, there certainly are, and I know with everything going on, this may not have uh, caught everybody's attention, but let me just uh, note that, um, you know, Today we're seeing Russian people uh, in the streets, open letters from leading Russian journalists cult and cultural figures denouncing President Putin's war of choice, and reports of Russian mothers concerned about the reckless deployment of their sons to this fratricidal war. I think it's important to remember back in 2014 when they didn't even acknowledge that they were sending Russian soldiers. They didn't even acknowledge when there were body bags coming back from Ukraine into Russia. And there is an outcry uh, in the streets by Russian people, uh, by, by more Russian people than I think many would expect. Uh, so despite Putin's uh, crackdown at home, dissenting views remain, and I think that's important to note. To publicly protest against President Putin and his war is a deeply courageous act. Their actions show the world that despite the Kremlin's propaganda, there are Russian people who profoundly disagree with what he is doing in Ukraine. And one more. Speaker Pelosi is talking about sending $600 million in lethal aid to Ukraine. Is this something you support? We are in uh, conversations uh, with uh, Congress, and I mentioned the President spoke with leaders uh, just earlier this afternoon. I don't have an exact number, but those are ongoing conversations about uh, what needs the Ukrainians have on the ground in a variety of categories, security, humanitarian, other economic assistance. Go ahead. Does the U.S. have uh, any analysis to indicate that there is dissent or division within Putin's government, or is it your understanding that Putin's government is united in this war? It's an interesting question, and Jamie, without getting into intelligence, uh, which obviously we look at, um, I mentioned obviously Russians protesting in the streets. That's not exactly what you asked about. But if you watched uh, the uh, meeting the president, uh, President Putin had uh, with uh, members of his national security team the other day, uh, it was quite striking the back and forth he had with his intel chief in that meeting. Uh, and uh, the, the analysis of that is certainly can be done in an open source manner, given it was quite public, but I will leave outside analysis to, uh, to give further assessment of that. And, and as you know, uh, we are seeing Ukrainians start to flee the country. Yeah. Is the U.S. prepared to accept Ukrainian refugees? We are, but we, we certainly expect that most, if not the majority, will want to go to Europe in neighboring countries. So we are also working with European countries on what the needs are, um, where there is uh, capacity. Uh, Poland, for example, where we are seeing a, a, an increasing uh, flow of refugees over the last 24 hours, or throw of, flow of individuals, I should say, out of Ukraine, what their needs are. And we've been talking and engaging with uh, Europeans about that for some time now. Well, part of what you're doing is to prepare for the United States to accept. The, the president is certainly prepared for that, but I would just note that because uh, there are a number of European countries neighboring Ukraine who have expressed an openness to it, um, we would anticipate many of them would want would want to go to European countries. And just one more quick yeah. question. Uh, the president, of course, has repeatedly said that American troops will not enter Ukraine. Yeah. Is there any scenario that has been discussed where that decision might be reconsidered? The president uh, has no intention of sending uh, U.S. troops to fight in Ukraine. That has not changed. Go ahead. Um, this was asked of the president earlier, but I don't think we got a full answer. Yesterday, uh, Vladimir Putin said that he warned if uh, others got involved of such consequences that you have never encountered in your history. Does the U.S. understand that as a threat of using nuclear weapons? Um, well, we, we can't obviously get into the mind of President Putin as much as he said that, uh, nor do we know uh, all the specific details about his strategic posture, but we don't see any increased threat in that regard at this point in time. Go ahead. Uh, just to follow up on some of the cyber questions. Sure. Um, I know that you and others have talked about 
how uh, the government is on alert for the potential of a cyber attack. But can you share, like, are there any specific steps that are being taken uh, that you can share that the U.S. is doing to protect the infrastructure, power grid, U.S. banks? Uh, well, I, I would say, one, we've been uh, – there's been efforts that have been ongoing for some time, since the beginning of the administration, to harden um, the private sector, or work the, with the private sector in partnership to harden their cybersecurity protections. We've actually seen a great deal of progress made in the financial sector. It's it's one of the stronger sectors in terms of protections from a cyber front uh, that we see out there. Uh, so it's been ongoing for several months. Um, obviously, uh, when there are moments like this where we continue to watch and look for what the potential is, uh, we will we continue to re to engage closely with a range of industries about what they need to do about the potential threats. Um, and that's something that happens obviously privately and through a range of agencies. I can see if there's anything more specific that we can read out to all of you. Just real, just real quick, one follow. Uh, President Biden said they are, that the U.S. is prepared if an attack comes there. Would, uh, pardon me, he said uh, prepared to respond. Would that response be a... A cyber attack. A cyber attack, yes. yes. Would that be an equivalent cyber attack against Russia? Uh, well, I would say that uh, the president reserves the option uh, to respond in any manner of his choosing, uh, overt or covert, um, uh, seen or unseen, as we like to say in, in more uh, available English. Um, but I'm not going to get into specifics of what that looks like. Uh, he has a range of options. Go ahead. Thanks. On oil prices and yeah. the SPR, does the administration have an oil price in mind that would trigger another release from the SPR? I think not that we're going to get into detail or from here, uh, JJ. I understand certainly the question. Um, what you heard the president talk about today, and I can just reiterate a little bit, is that what has been ongoing, both from the president, who's been very engaged in this, uh, having conversations with leaders in the Middle East and other parts of the world, as well as many members of his national security team, uh, taking whatever steps we can to mitigate uh, the impact on the global oil markets. Uh, and obviously that means increasing supply. Obviously a coordinated release from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve would be part of that. But in terms of what that looks like or the specifics, I'm just not in a position to get into more details at this point. Thanks. If the worst happens and Russia either reduces the flow of natural gas or cuts off energy altogether to Europe, does the administration have a good idea for how long households in Europe could last under that kind of circumstance? I, I don't have an assessment of that um, from here. I can certainly check with our economic team. One thing I will say that one of the steps we've been taking, obviously natural gas shortages and supply is, it, it is an enormous regional issue, one that would hugely impact Europe more than here, of course. One of the steps we've been focused on and been taking is engaging with um, partners who have, uh, who may have excess, ac excess um, LNG supply, like uh, countries in Europe, Japan, for example, where they had, where we would, were planning to give them some, and now they're going to divert it to Europe. Um, so we've been working to um, to help mitigate um, any impact of a further invasion and a shortage uh, in Europe. Go ahead. Some of the activity that we've seen today in Ukraine, some of the clashes have been in and around Chernobyl. Does the United States have an assessment of the risk of a radioactive release? So I, I do have one actual update on that as well. There's also been uh, – there was also a um, report out – so let me speak to this first just so I don't forget um, – about um, uh, host uh, uh, hostages uh, around there as well. So let me speak to that first. Uh, we are outraged by credi credible reports that Russian soldiers are currently holding the staff of the Chernobyl facilities hostage. This unlawful and dangerous hostage taking, which could upend the routine civil service efforts required to maintain and protect uh, the nuclear waste facilities, is obviously incredibly alarming and greatly concerning. Concerning, We condemn it and we request their release. In terms of a further assessment, I don't have anything more on that from here. And you gave a readout of how the President spent the past 24 hours or so. Uh, first, I wanted to ask about his call with President Zelensky. Did he indicate if he was still in Kyiv? Did he identify his location at this point? Uh, we are aware of where uh, he is located, um, and we are in touch with him. I would say on that call, uh, what uh, what um, they discussed is uh, President Zelensky's uh, request for the president to be uh, to condemn the actions of uh, President Putin and the Russians and to engage with other global leaders about it, and that's exactly what he's done. We've seen a number of statements today from former presidents, uh, President Obama, President Bush, and also saw former President Trump on television talking about this. Has the president you mentioned uh, during the Afghan? Afghanistan drawn out he had been in contact with his predecessors. Has he been in touch with any of his predecessors during this? He has not been today. 
and then in terms of another domestic priority mm -hmm. that was potentially included in his meetings sure. today, uh, given the situation, his time and focus and attention on the Supreme Court, uh, excuse me, on Ukraine, will this affect the timing of his Supreme Court announcement? Uh, we, we are still on track to make an announcement before the end of the month. We have to do a lot of things around here at the same time. Go ahead. Uh, just to follow up on the cyber attacks and Article 5 sure. question, I know you said that it's up to NATO to decide, but from a U.S. perspective, uh, would any cyber attack against a NATO ally trigger Article 5, or would there be a measure for what, what counts? Again, this is a conversation we would have with our NATO allies and partners. I don't have more ad anything in addition to add to it. And just to follow up on the Supreme Court, um, I know you said you're on, on track, but has he made a final decision given there are basically two days left? Uh, for the end of the month? Uh, not, a, not a final final, uh, and no offer has been, no job offer has been made. Go ahead. Thanks. Uh, just a couple. Um, are there any concerns or indications at this point that Russia had prepared for the sanctions that you're putting in place and kind of developed preemptively ways to blunt that impact? Well, uh, it's an interesting question, and, it's, and some of it is, is hard because it's hard to get into the minds of President Putin and the oligarchs around him. Uh, one of the steps we tried to take is to, uh, you know, as we, were, as we were contemplating the individuals we were going to uh, sanction, we, uh, we sanctioned uh, family members as well, because what we've seen the tactics they've used in the past is they've moved money around and resources around to family members, and we tried to address that on the front end. In terms of the banking the, and the financial sector, I mean, it, it accounts for such a large percentage of, of how they do business, that that is, it would be a difficult thing for them to plan and plot against. And if you look to uh, just even the anticipation of the potential sanctions, as Dalip was mentioning, you know, the ruble is the worst performing currency in the world right now. Uh, their inflation is, has skyrocketed. Uh, so we're even seeing in their markets the anticipated impact even before today, and that's even before the actual squeeze on, uh, on the financial sector uh, in the country. Uh, so it, it, it feels to me it would be a little hard to plan around and plot around given the significance of what was done today and the fact that um, when we uh, sanctioning 10, uh, 10 of Russia's financial uh, institutions and these export control measures, which essentially cuts President Putin off from semiconductors and access to a range of technology he wants for the future, uh, those are difficult things to uh, plan ahead for. I guess, secondly, um, does the administration have any assessment for how China is reacting to this at this point, whether they are willing to provide support to Russia, how much, and has there been any kind of contact there to kind of attempt to move them off of any support? Well, uh, in terms of uh, what impact they can have, I mean, China uh, only accounts for about 15 percent of China and Russia, I'm not sure, you can double check me on this, about 15 percent of the global economy. If you look at G7 partners in the U.S. and Europe, it's about 50 percent, right? So they cannot cover uh, what the impact of the sanctions that have been announced in coordination with Europe, would, how they would impact Russia. You know, I think from our perspective as it relates to China, well, I can't get into the heads of, of what their thinking is, you know, this is a really a moment for China, for any country, to think about what side of history they want to stand on here. Um, and, you know, that is certainly the, the, the case that um, we would make publicly and privately. I think you saw that Secretary Blinken spoke with his counterpart just a couple of days ago. Uh, you know, the President's certainly open to speaking with his counterpart, but I don't have any prediction of that at this point in time or a timeline. Go ahead. Thanks, Jen. Over the past couple of weeks, as you've been sending the alarm on this, you've put the sanctions package together, done, conducted diplomacy with the Russians and the rest of the world. Um, how did uh, the Ukrainian government use that time uh, since they've been initially warned that this was a likelihood? Did they use that time wisely to prepare? Tell me more about what you mean exactly. Well, uh, you're seeing reports from uh, uh, the streets in, in Russia of, or, sorry, in uh, Ukraine of people being surprised. Uh, you had, obviously, uh, local and national leadership in Ukraine uh, uh, telling people to stay calm, to remit, to go to work, even the day before uh, the invasion began. So were they properly prepared, and was there more that they could have done uh, in the lead up? Look, I think it's not particularly constructive for us to give an assessment of that. Uh, what, uh, what I can tell you is that our focus has been on providing uh, up-to-date 
uh, what has turned out to be quite accurate and transparent information about what the President Putin uh, has was preparing to do, uh, which is invade Ukraine. Uh, and we have been very clear with American citizens who are there. We have been clear with our European partners uh, for months now, uh, including Ukrainian leadership. Uh, so that has been what our focus has been. Um, and you know, we will remain a strong support, supporter and partner of, uh, of uh, President Zelensky in Ukraine moving forward. Go ahead. Um, following up on the sanction question, yeah. uh, we have heard for, for weeks that these sanctions were at least in part a part of a strategy that was based on deterrence yeah. as well as prevention. Uh, today, with the President's comment that no one expected the sanctions to prevent anything from happening, moving forward, do you expect this slate of sanctions to prevent any further advancement or aggression from Russia? Well, I would say that later in the, later in the back and forth or the press avail, he also said when asked, um, if sanctions cannot stop President Putin, what penalty can? And he said, I didn't say sanctions couldn't stop him, which leads me to believe that's not exactly what he meant. He also went on to say the threat of sanctions and imposing the sanctions and seeing the effect of sanctions are two different things. And the way we look at this, broadly speaking, and Dilip touched on this a little bit, is that we do see them as having a deterrent I impact, right? It doesn't mean they're 100 percent foolproof. But if you, um, if there's a 95 percent chance of Russia invading without the threat of sanctions, and there's a 60, I'm making up these percentages just to make a point, but uh, and a 65 percent chance uh, that they will with them, you're obviously going to go with the threat of sanctions because you want to reduce the threat of an invasion. So there is a deterrent. And we've seen a, the deterrent impact work at times, right? Um, I'd also note, though, that we are very clear-eyed about the fact that President Putin, not just a few days ago, I mean, he gave the speech a few days ago where he questioned the legitimacy of Ukraine as a sovereign country. He's also talked about how the breakup of the Soviet Union was the worst thing that's happened, that's a paraphrase, um, in recent, uh, you know, in, in decades of history. So we are clear-eyed about his ambition. But what the other part of it that we are quite focused on is the consequences. And the way we see it is, you know, as we've touched on a little bit, inflation skyrocketing, the ruble is the worst performing currency in the world. It was his decision to go to war. It's our choice to make him pay a price. Same with the global community. And we believe these consequences are also going to have an impact. Just at the risk of repeating your question yeah. as well, I mean, the president did also say, you know, let's check in in a month. And there has been some questions yeah. about time here. It seems like this is a strategy to use these sanctions to put pressure on Russia to eventually discourage them to pull out or to, to force them to pull out this, this advance. So what is the timetable here, you think, for when the Russian government will start actually feeling the impact of these sanctions and possibly pull out? Well, in many senses, they're already feeling the impact. I mean, look at where the ruble is. Look at where inflation is. Look at uh, where the markets are in Russia. Um, in terms of how Putin will feel the, the impact, we just sanctioned a range of oligarchs around him. We sanctioned 10 financial institutions. Um, these, are all, uh, these are all significant, um, in, enormous steps that are going to have an impact on him. But in terms of the moment by moment, I can't give you an assessment of that. Just off topic, Go ahead. Just, uh, there's been a lot of questions about refugees in the region. Yeah. For Ukrainians that are in the country, yeah. is the U.S., especially after yesterday, considering TPS or any sort of Protection. Sure. As, as you know, that's a, a decision that would be made through an interagency process led by the Department of Homeland Security, um, and I don't have any prediction of that. I mean, I don't have any kind of prediction of that uh, at this point in time. Obviously, these these events are just unfolding as we speak. That process hasn't started, that conversation. I'm not going to give you any specifics on an internal process, but I would just say, again, it's an interagency process, and right now uh, we're, of course, in the middle of an invasion and, uh, and a, uh, you know, a war in, uh, in Ukraine. Go ahead. Thanks, Jen. Earlier you had said uh, you have to do a lot of things at the same time. One of those things, of course, is the State of the Union next yes. week. Yes. Can you tell us how the president this week has been preparing for that, how much time he spent on this speech, and how he's juggling that with this very busy schedule that you laid out earlier tonight? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so in addition to obviously uh, being very closely engaged and leading the effort uh, on the U.S. response uh, to the Russia to Russia the Russian military invasion of Ukraine, uh, the president has been uh, working with speechwriters, uh, working with pol members of his policy team to uh, finalize details of his State of the Union. Uh, doing starting to do some read-throughs, not too many yet. I expect those will increase in the days ahead. Uh, I expect we won't have too much of a preview for you. Maybe tomorrow, but maybe more likely this weekend. Uh, he's also been uh, engaging with his COVID team. 
uh, talking about where we are in the state of the pandemic, what's next in the pandemic. Uh, he's been working closely with his economic team on uh, and receiving updates on the supply chain, the implementation of the infrastructure uh, bill. So even as we have all been understandably focused on the conflict uh, in Ukraine, the president has been very hard at work on a range of issues that are vital to the American people. Can you touch on my follow-up. ABC is reporting that the White House is revamping the COVID strategy now that hospitalizations are on the decline. Should we ex expect the president to roll that out in the speech next Tuesday? I don't have any uh, preview for you on timeline or format, um, but uh, the president has been working and engaged with his COVID team uh, for some time now, uh, and we're making strong, strong progress uh, on uh, moving toward a time when COVID is no longer a crisis. Um, the COVID team has been spending a lot of time and energy, including with the president, working with experts inside and outside government, local public health officials and governors, uh, and this work is broader than one piece of guidance. How we look at it is we're preparing to stay ahead of the virus, protecting our most vulnerable, keeping our country open, uh, and that is and that is going to look at everything from the CDC is obviously reviewing mass guidance, but also uh, how we're going to ensure that vaccines, boosters, tests, treatments, uh, and, other, uh, and other important components of our medicine cabinet are available to the American people. Go ahead. Thanks, Jen. Oh. Uh, I had a couple of oh, questions. Sure. And then I'll go to you next. Go ahead. Thanks. I had a couple of questions. First, a follow up about some of the humanitarian needs you've been talking about. Sure. You talked about how much money and supplies are going to be going, but how are you going to ensure that those supplies get to the Ukraine? Yeah. Is there going to be some sort of airdrop? And would the president consider putting U.S. boots on the ground for humanitarian needs to make sure they get to the people that need them? Well, we, we do have fortunately or unfortunately, a fair amount of experience on providing humanitarian assistance in conflict zones. Uh, and we typically work, uh, and USAID specifically has a great deal of experience um, with that, working with trusted third party uh, entities, obviously the government, which remains in power. Um, so there's a range of ways that we would provide assistance uh, in terms of other mechanisms. I don't have anything to predict for you at this point in time. And then another question for you, and this is been happening while you've been up at the podium. Okay. So, <laughs> I'm not trying to ambush you, but sure. I wanted to give you a chance to respond. Um, Senator Ted Cruz is speaking at CPAC, and you came up. He oh. um, he called you, quote unquote, peppermint patty, and has oh. encouraged people to boo you. So I wanted to. Don't, don't tell him I like peppermint patty. I, so I'm not going to take it too offensively. <laughs> Senator Cruz, I like peppermint patty. I, I'm a little tougher than that, but there you go. Go ahead. Hi, yeah, so um, back to the president's comments earlier today. So he did say to give it a month to see if these sanctions work. Yeah. However, you know, under Russia's current assault, Ukraine clearly might not have a month or even weeks. So is it fair to say that he is conceding Ukraine to, to Putin? There's nothing about the president's strategy or approach or leadership in the world uh, building a coalition of uh, the majority of countries, uh, you know, in the Western world, uh, to stand against the actions of President Putin, uh, that that's that suggests that he is succeeding anything. Um, you saw him lay out a set of uh, of, uh, of historic. Uh, sanctions today that will maximize pain on Russia. Yes, uh, as we've as we've conveyed, they're meant to have a squeeze over the course of time. But we're already seeing an impact on the financial markets, on the currency, on inflation in Russia. And there is a there are unfortunately the Russian people are going to feel the pain of that. Uh, so I would say the president is going to continue uh, as he has for weeks now to work in close lockstep with European partners to continue to press uh, to press uh, from the global community uh, for uh, de-escalation as it relates to the events in Ukraine. Go ahead. Thank you, Jen. If President Zelensky is in danger of being killed or captured and put on some sort of a show trial, would President Biden send U.S. troops in on a rescue mission to get him out? Again, we are in touch with President Zelensky, who is an important partner. We support him. Who he's the leader of Ukraine, governor, the president of Ukraine. Uh, but I'm not going to get into security steps. Okay. Um, there's this talk about a possible forecast for financial pain, particularly at the gas pump yeah. for Americans. Um, the president said today, the notion that this is going to last for a long time is highly unlikely. Would he try to ensure that by lifting some of the restrictions that he's put in place on the energy industry or rethinking some projects like the Keystone Pipeline? 
Well, first of all, the Keystone pipeline is not flowing, so I'm not sure how that would solve anything. There's also plenty of oil leases that are not being tapped into by oil companies, so you should talk to them about that and why. Uh, but what the President's talking about is we certainly understand, and he said this today, right? may have been in response to your question. I don't remember. But um, if there's an invasion of another country by a big country, there's going to be impacts on the markets, right? And we certainly anticipated that, and we anticipate that as it relates to the global oil market as well. So that's why the President, for weeks now, has been engaging with a range of big global suppliers, some in the Middle East, others, to see what we can do to ensure there's supply out there in the market to reduce the impact on the American people. And the U.S. is one of the Russian oil industry's best customers, hundreds of thousands of barrels per day. Would the president ever consider ordering U.S. companies to stop importing Russian oil? I don't have any prediction of that at this point, Peter. We announced some significant sanctions uh, today. Uh, our objective is to, uh, in, uh, to in ensure there is the greatest p uh, economic pain on Russia, and pre not on the Russian people, but on President Putin, and to uh, mi minimize the impact on the American people, including companies here in the United States. Okay. All right. Thanks, everyone. Uh, See you uh, tomorrow. You said that he thinks that Putin's going to go and try to expand back the Soviet Union. So is this, do, do you all think this is act one in a multiple country invasion? Well, uh, I'm not going to make a prediction of that, but we certainly think he has grander ambitions and in Ukraine. By that same point, does he believe that uh, President Putin is going to absorb Ukraine into Russia when he says that President Putin wants to reestablish the Soviet Union? Is that what he's saying? I, I think he believes that, uh, as we all do, that President Putin has more, has grander ambitions in Ukraine, hence the military uh, campaign is continuing. Thanks, everyone.